On this edition of Dream Garage, we see how an amazing space can be created even when you have constraints by the city. But first, we visit what may be our biggest dream garage yet. I'm your host, Ray Eddings. Our first dream garage is massive. If it isn't our biggest dream garage yet, it will be by the time the owner gets done with it. Rick, the owner of a trucking company, has made his current building a dream come true. I was born in Long Beach, grew up in Wilmington. We're uh, the home of Lions Drag Strip, where I got a lot of my, my early uh, taste of cars. And we uh, run a trucking company, Price Transfer Incorporated, and uh, the automobile is part of that as far as our advertising arm of that. And uh, we really have kind of a lot of fun at it. This is uh, the latest building we're in, is this particular building here. We've been here about 12 years and decided to make it a, a car paradise. So that's what we did. <laughs> As the family's business grew, so did Rick's car collection. I bought my first Willys in 1960. I bought another one in 1963. I bought a couple Willys pickups in 64. And I've had them since we've always been in the warehousing transportation business. I've had them sitting around, but it wasn't until uh, we moved into this facility here where it kind of lent itself to opening a shop. Rick had high expectations when he decided to build this dream garage. Rick made sure there was enough room to do everything the right way, and even had people to do it. We hired guys that had previous experience building cars and ran a shop. So we do uh, from everything from painting, body work, fabrication, pretty much self-contained except for the engine work, and we're thinking about maybe getting a little into that as well, but it's much easier to have it. the experts do that. Hot rods is a big part of our shop, as well as stock cars. And uh, you'll see a lot of willies around here. We kind of specialize in willies, but we do add and have a lot of iconic cars here, various makes and models from, uh, from years gone by that have some significant meaning to uh, car fanciers. And uh, there's a car for everybody here. The entire building is 70,000 square feet, and I think about 45,000 of that is involved in the automobilia showroom, fabrication rooms, and repair rooms that we have here. And uh, we have plenty of room, and it's nice. We got a big yard here, so we can go do uh, car testing <laughs> without somebody getting on us for it. So it's nice. It's a dream come true. The main focus of Rick's collection are the hot rods he grew up with. I've always liked loud and fast cars, and that's where I started uh, building my Willys collection because they were the the, uh, the gassers of the 50s, 60s especially. Those were the cars that I followed very heavily. I just got into cars and noise, and that's why I lost all my hearing. <laughs> this was the Willys I bought in 64. Uh, we finally finished oh, about a year ago, and in the, the form of a 60s gasser. A lot of people might remember Big John Mazzamini had a candy apple red willies like this, and uh, that was an iconic car, is an iconic car, and we can't drive it on the street. It's not legal. My first willies that I purchased in 1960 right here, that one day we will finish in the spirit of the 60s. We won't make a hot rod, or we'll just pretty much leave it like it is, and get it fixed up. Next to it, we have a 41 Willys gasser that has a, a small Chevy in it now, which will soon get a big blown Oldsmobile motor in it. We're trying to have Willys with blown Olds, blown Chryslers, blown Chevys, and just to represent all years of, uh, and models of Willys that may have been out in those days. One of our latest prized possessions is this 36 Willys panel delivery that we just finished building here. And we built this from a pile of rust. And that's, you know, what we can do here, we can take a rust bucket and make it into a real car. So exactly what does a Willy sound like, you ask? Ha! Ah. A little cold blooded, it'll warm up. Outside of the Willys collection is a ton of classic cars. One vintage pickup truck bears responsibility for everything in Rick's collection. This is uh, our basically our first truck that the company started with, 1961 Chevy. Didn't look quite as nice then as it does now. It's been had a little care to it, but uh, that is what started the company and actually was the backbone of the company for probably 15 years. 
till we moved into our first warehouse. All we did is haul baggage, passenger baggage, nothing big. And it was me and my dad usually that drove around in it doing this. So that's the start of it all. Inside Rick's dream garage, a facade of the past. And it houses fond memories of when he worked at his dad's Texaco station. My dad had a Texaco gas station for 18 years prior to him buying Mr. Price's truck and starting in the trucking business in 1959. And then that's where I washed windows and did all my kind of stuff when I was a kid. What appears real at first are murals of friends and family painted into these memories of the past. The murals on the wall, in the foster freeze and on the wall, are these are my daughter, Sharon, who used to work for the company, Adana, who still works at my high school buddies, Eddie and Tom, family, nephew, sister, niece, Rob, the man that runs the shop, myself, and my brother and his wife. So we kind of just put it all together in kind of a family pictorial just to kind of bring back the good old days. And this is Wilmington, Pacific Coast Highway between Wilmington Boulevard and Avalon. This is where we spent most of our time eating El Taco, the Rainer Stencil, Jamar Drive-In. That's where we lived on that block there and cruise around town all the time. Foster Freeze, right next door. Speed shop, we used to, as kids, being hot rodders, we used to always wind up in speed shops. So we ended up a speed shop, you know, next to our, uh, our nostalgic stuff. I grew up in the 50s, 60s, and that's the theme here. I think those were the good days. 61 Chrysler 300G, very uh, large, iconic car from the day. This was actually, you could call this one of the beginning muscle cars as well, even though it's a lot heavier than most. Let me show you a feature this had. Besides push button transmission, it had swivel seats. At the end here, we have a 61 Cadillac convertible. It's called the Eldorado Buritz, which is the, the top of the line just a totally gorgeous, beautiful car. Interior matches the exterior. It's just awesome, 21 feet long. And how about this? Around the corner is a fully functional diner. Well, we built this uh, diner uh, off of a number of pictures and menus. We uh, designed it ourselves here, put it together. We had the help of a movie set guy that helped us design this and pick the colors. And right behind it is the arcade, which uh, has a number of of our pinball machines in it that we like. All the records are original records and their covers that were framed out. And baseball pinball machines, there's about four of them here. All games aside, Rick is already expanding this massive dream garage. This is the uh, future edition, probably ready in a couple months. We're gonna have a movie theater uh, front there. We have a hobby shop as their first room here. And then we're gonna have a record store a little cigar store and a barber shop and the movie theater and this will all be here finished out and the rest of it will be car parking this dream garage is endless this is our finishing area for finishing the cards or doing the uh, the service on them or repairs when needed the minor work this 42 willies pickup truck it's my daughter's and she's very proud of it and she claims to win more trophies than i do and so we have that argument 62 Chevy Nova convertible. The last year they made convertibles in a Nova. Outstanding car. And Adana, who runs our company here, she drives this one around. 57 Chevy Bel Air hardtop. Classic American hot rod or classic car. 51 Hudson Hornet. One NASCAR back in 51 and 52, I believe. This was the fastest car on the road. It's only a six cylinder twin H power. But believe it or not, back when NASCAR in its early days, this is the car that won two of the championships. Delman Louise, the movie, that's the car, not the car, but the make, 66 Thunderbird. That's the one, not the one that went off the cliff. It's a 50 old coupe that we're just finishing building now, built in the fashion of a 1950s hot rod, what you'd have done back in the 50s. Nosed and decked and uh, three twos and got the regular old motor in it. But this is what you'd have probably done back then. And that's why we built that, to stay in the original mode. And here you have a one of a kind, or they may be two of them, Willie's uh, Roadster. This was built by uh, Taylor, the, uh, he built fiberglass bodies. And he took a coupe and cut the top off it, made it into a Roadster. So it's very unique, totally awesome, faster than heck. Fast is important. In yet another area of this building, Rick has a stockpile of future projects. 
This we call the Boneyard. These are all future projects that we have that we will accomplish within the next 10 years. Probably, I hope I'm wrong that long. But we have a Chrysler Elephant Motors, Oldsmobile Motors. And this one, if anybody's watching that can identify that car, it was a custom, it was a Willys that was narrowed with a lot of custom work done on it. And it was done back in the 50s and it belonged to some ladies up in Pebble Beach. And I think they narrowed it so they could go on the golf course. Can anybody identify who built that car? That's what we're looking for. 31 Willys uh, Roadster, all stock. Actually, this is a right-hand drive that was built in Australia. The headlight assembly on this car is called a wood or woods. The headlight assembly and the uh, accessories with it cost as much as the car. Each project takes about a year, some year and a half, and some of the real detailed ones where you're trying to make a, a real special car could take two years to build. So right there in that lineup, we have 12 cars that could be uh, 12 years. At the heart of this dream garage is a fabrication shop. We're working on this 22 Willys Night, which is all the woodwork we did from our wood shop. This car was like half its wood and um, we had to restore it because the termites, termites had a hundred years to eat on this thing and they did a pretty good job. And it's gonna be a great, great car, a great stock car, we can keep it stock. Right over here we have the frame of a 36 Willys pickup truck and this is how you all start on restoring cars. You, you build the frames and then you get the bodies and you get everything going here. This is all fabrication. This is our body shop here that we do the body work and prepare it for painting. What we have in here now is a, uh, a 1950 Studebaker convertible, kind of a, a very iconic car. It's got the bullet nose front end, very rare. We don't know, there's not too many of these around, but we're restarting it original. It's not gonna be a hot rod, it's gonna be original. We have a car in here we're painting. It's a 1957 Ford Thunderbird getting down to the nitty gritty. And that's kind of uh, the end of the shop. Nothing is for sale here. It's just, you know, we provide this to the community and that's what we built it for. It's, this is definitely not a money-making project here. <laughs> Rick's Dream Garage takes restoring and collecting to a whole new level and at a scale unlike anything else. Stay tuned for more Dream Garage. By now you've noticed these dream garages are typically built to showcase the owner's car collections. Paul is a member of that fortunate group. His dream garage has helped him bring his collection under one roof. Retired three years ago and which now allows me to spend more time with the cars that I collect and I also uh, try to improve my golf game which is becoming very frustrating. I think I'm happier with my cars. Tennis isn't Paul's game, but because he and his wife decided to demo their tennis court, they were able to make way for Paul's dream garage. Before I built the garage, these cars were all over the place. I kept some downtown, some here at the house, and um, but they were spread around. And then at about four years ago, I said, look it, I've got to find a way to bring it all together under one roof. And uh, we had a tennis court here at the home and that wasn't being utilized anymore. And we said, okay. Why don't we tear out the tennis court and see if we can build a, a garage where the tennis court was. Once the tennis court was demolished, Paul went through the process of getting his dream garage approved. The city would green light the project, but his dream garage would be limited to 3,000 square foot, much less than Paul had hoped for. Well, we uh, tore, the, tore it all out and uh, started to deal with the city of Pasadena and they said, fine, you can build a garage, but you can't build a garage you really wanted to build. We're only going to let you build a 3,000 square foot garage. So with that restriction, we got an architect and we designed the garage that, uh, that you see today. The balance of the property that the tennis court sat on, my wife now has it as an expansion of her, of her flower garden. And so we're both happy. I have my garage for my cars and she has uh, her flower garden. Happy wife? Check. Happy marriage, check. Indestructible dream garage, double check. The garage is a uh, all built out of um, cement block with a lot of reinforced concrete. Again, the city uh, had uh, a lot of restrictions. It took us 14 months to get it permitted. Uh, it's got so much rebar in it that if there was a, a quake, I suspect it would be one of the structures in the city that would probably still be there. 
It's air conditioned, it's sprinklered, it's heated, and uh, as you could see, we have got it set up with a hoist so we can work on the cars. Two thirds of the garage itself is under grade, underground, which really is, uh, is good from a climatic standpoint, even though it's air conditioned and heated, and it's fairly dust proof, so very little dirt gets into the garage. The motivation for Paul to build his dream garage was to fill it with the cars he envied growing up. One of the cars in the, in the garage is, uh, is a 1956 Austin Healey, which uh, I bought uh, because uh, when I met my wife almost 50 years ago at college, uh, she stepped off the curb. I had a little Austin Healey and I almost ran her over, so it has certain uh, symbolic things about it that I enjoyed. So basically a lot of the cars that I have in my garage are cars that I had when I was growing up or in some cases wanted to have. Over here we have a uh, 56 Austin Healey Factory M, and uh, it's a real Factory M. Uh, they made 640 of these for racing. And the factory sold the dealers the same pistons and everything else than dealers would install them, but they weren't one of the 640. What makes this thing very unique is that it really was one of the 640. It's certificated, certificated as one of them, and it was built for racing by the factory. One of Paul's favorites is a 1955 Mercedes 300 SL Goldwing. To give you an idea of what we have here in its day, which was the mid-50s, this is a 55. It was about the fastest production car around. It, it beat everything at the various major races around the world. Most collections around the world now appear to have a 300 SL. Uh, not because it's a, you know, a $10 million car, because it's not but just the idea that it was so far ahead of its time when they built it. it uh, first car to have uh, fuel injection. It's a mechanical fuel injection, but it was the very first car to have fuel injection. For those of us that don't have four million or so for a Goldwing, Paul has another option for you. Over here is the poor man's 300 SL. It's a 190 Mercedes 57. Uh, I've had it for a number of years, we restored it. All these cars we're talking about are, have been restored and for the most part they're all show cars. This car is a four-cylinder car, it's really very pretty, Mercedes builds great cars. Uh, this one it does, isn't fast, but it's, I think it's uh, the design of it which is very similar to the 300 SL. It's a beautiful car, extremely well made, uh, it's not a, a sports car, it's a, a, a car that is you know, fun to drive on the open highway. Obviously in the city it's just fine, but it's not a race car. It just looks pretty. When we built the garage, we said, okay, we need to have a, a place to be comfortable because one of the good things about uh, having a garage at your house is you can come out on a Sunday morning in your pajamas with a Bloody Mary and enjoy your cars rather than get in your car, you know, drive for 15, 20 minutes or an hour to some uh, industrial park where most of these uh, collections usually are. And in this case, I can walk, you know, 100 and 200 feet and be in my own environment with my garage and my cars. So what we did is we allocated a certain portion of the garage for sort of a, a sitting area. We have a bar in there, we have a 1011 jute box, a Wurlitzer jute box, we have a slot machine, and we have the, the Coke machine, we have a beer dispenser, we have a little wine refrigerator. We have some cases around here that have the trophies that these cars have won over the years. But we come out here, the grandkids come out here, we can play the jute box and the kids can uh, listen to all the 50s music which is in the jute box and it plays old 78 records. And it's in there is all the original 78 records that they played in the 50s. Here we have a, a 62 Porsche 356 Twin Grill Super 90 Roadster. This car is a little different. There's only 25 of these in the world. Essentially, Porsche in 62 made 250 Twin Grill Roadsters. They only made 25 of them that have the motor in it, but this has the Super 90 motor. It is about 110 horsepower, a little more than that, because we've done a few things to it. It's a fun car to drive. It's a little more sophisticated uh, than the earlier Porsches, simply because this one has roll-up windows. But again, it's, it's quite rare, and uh, we take this on rallies. Uh, for essentially, all the cars you're seeing, we, we drive. My interest in the cars started when I was uh, probably even before I could drive. Before I had a license, I had a car, spent more time 
under it than I did on it or in it and it just grew from there. It started with a little 50 Ford two-door that I had and then it started to get into more exotic cars. Over here we have a Ferrari, it's a Ferrari Daytona. This is a 71. In the early 70s this was the fastest car around and it would just about take everything. It's a 12-cylinder car, six carburetors, 375 horsepower and uh, would do about 175 miles an hour uh, back in the uh, early 70s and that was fast. It's a, uh, strictly a car for the track or an open highway. It's hard to steer. So you want to be on an open road. On an open road, this thing is beautiful. You try to parallel park it, uh, don't try to do that. It can't be an official dream garage if there isn't a 32 Ford under the roof. Over here, we have a 32 Ford full fendered Roadster. This is a 50s hot rod. I've had this for a number of years and it's uh, under the hood, it's got a, uh, a supercharged flathead motor. It has a Columbia rear end, but everything in it is strictly period for 1950s hot rodding. And not far from that 32 are these beautiful Corvettes. The 55 Corvette was the first year they put a V8 in a Corvette. This body style started in 53. In 53, they made 300 of these cars. Then in 54, same body style, they made 3,500. And then in 55, when they put the V8 in the car, they only made 700 of these cars. It has a, a two-speed power glide transmission, which is kind of unfortunate because it's somewhat of a slug, but it looks good and it's somewhat collectible because it's one of 700 that had the V8 uh, motor put in them. This next to it is a 57 Fuley. Now, that's a whole different ball game. In 1957, this is the first car that uh, Corvette built that they put fuel injection in. And this thing's a hot rod. This thing really moves. You compare these two, considering they're only two years apart, the performance difference is dramatic. This thing is a four-speed, very, very high-performance motor. The fun of being a car collector is being involved in the restoration process. Paul tries to be as involved and hands-on as he can. I like to somehow participate to some extent in the work that's being done with my car. So these people that work on them I've known for a long time and I try to help in every way I can and I enjoy doing that. This garage is a working garage even though it's set up as a, uh, a garage that you can come out and, and enjoy looking at the cars. I have a mechanic, a Porsche mechanic that comes here and works on the cars. I have a Ferrari mechanic that comes out, a Mercedes mechanic and various other people that come to the garage to work on the cars. Occasionally I have to take them uh, to various shops, but I try to get the people to come here if at all possible. We have a hoist. We have uh, most of the equipment needed to do the majority of work uh, on any of the cars that uh, need attention. Here we have a uh, 1962 a Mercedes 220 SE Cabriolet. I'm the second owner of this car. We got it. We re-restored it, took it down to the metal, everything in it, we, we went from scratch. And it's, uh, again, it's a, uh, certainly not a race car, but you drive this car, it would be like driving the new Cadillacs today or luxury cars today. It just uh, is a wonderful car to drive. It, it's real comfortable. Again, it, it's not a, a hot rod, but it is probably a, just a very, very fine passenger car. And as you can see, it's just a very pretty car. Over here we have a car we're just in the process of, of finishing restoration on. It's a 56 Alfa Romeo. It's a CSS three-window coupe. And I think it's one of the prettiest cars that uh, Alfa has built. And we are in the final stages of completing restoration on it. Uh, it'll be primarily used for rally. I may show it a couple of times before I put it into a rally, but it'll be a wonderful rally car. We're in the process of putting a five-speed transmission in it. Right now it has a three-speed column shift, which um, some of them came with that, some did not. Unfortunately, this did. So we're putting a, a more modern five-speed floor transmission in it, which will make it a whole lot better to drive and certainly for rally uh, purposes. Here we have a uh, 1960 Ferrari PF Coupe, that's Pina Farina Coupe. Uh, this car, again, is a 12-cylinder car. It's a GT car. It's not a race car. It's certainly a very good rally car. This car we've put in, oh, half a dozen shows. It's won everything. This, this car is just, again, it's not a, um, a race car, although it's got the same motor in it. 
that some of the race cars have but this was built more for a GT type of driving, not necessarily uh, heavy duty racing. I think anybody that's in the car hobby has certain cars that they kind of lust over you know, as they uh, grow up and, uh, and finally are able to, to purchase the car. Most of them it's primarily because I like the design of the car and the, uh, the performance of the car and the fact that when it's all over and done with, uh, I make these investments and they really are investments because I know they'll appreciate so I'm really transferring one asset to get another asset. So I look for cars that are collectible today or in my opinion will be even more collectible a few years from now. Paul overcame the odds of a city that wasn't favorable to his vision of a dream garage. He is now enjoying retirement, his cars, his wife, and that flower garden. I'm your host Ray Eddings. Join us next time for more Dream Garage. Like this show? Want more? Then head to WatchPTTV.com, the new 100% free PowerTube TV streaming network. Home of the best classic and new motorsports racing and build shows on the web.